excited about our first Nebraska Nature Nerd Night of the year. I'm really excited. We got some good topics. I know. Like we're we're coming out like really ready with this topic. Today. Yes. Just gonna hit it all up. Yes. Are you ready to start off the the typical way? So if you joined us before, you kind of know our little beginning to this. If you haven't, you're in for a real treat. Or we're sorry. Or we're sorry. Depending on one of the two. All right. <laughs> ready? If you're a nature loving science nerd, we think that you just might be happy like us to start Nebraska Nature Nerd Night. Turtles, fish, and vertebrates, disease, and fungi, too. If you're a curious brainiac, we got a show for you. Oh my God, that never right. gets old. It's so nerdy, but it works. Yay. All right. Welcome, everyone, to our first Nebraska Nature Nerd Night of 2022. And welcome back if you've joined us from last year. So uh, tonight, like Amber said, we're going to go full force and come at you tonight with some animal love. So yesterday was Valentine's Day. That's right. I happy, knew I was missing something. Yes. <laughs> happy belated Valentine's Day. Um, <clears throat> we're going to go ahead and talk a little bit about animal love tonight. So um, my name is Monica McCoubrey, and I'm the Wildlife Education Specialist with the Nebraska Game and Parks Commission. I'm Amber Schultz. I'm the Wildlife Education Program Manager with Game and Parks. All right, and so like we mentioned, we're gonna go ahead and talk about Nature Nerd Night. We're gonna talk about some really nerdy love things tonight. Well, we can't have all the fun in the love world, right? Not, not all of it, no. We have just a really quick thing that we wanna show you. Um, sorry, everyone, wrong button. Um, all right, so really quick, we are going to talk about, like I said, animal love tonight. Um, just so that everybody knows, we do want to make sure that everything stays on topic tonight. So if you have questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. Uh, just make sure that they are topically relevant to kind of what we're talking about. Um, we'll either get to you right away or we do have kind of a question answer session towards yeah. the end. Mm -hmm. um, so just be patient with us if we don't get to it right away. Um, but then also just remember that if we have little ears in the audience tonight, um, we are talking about animal love. We were going to we're going to be professional, but we also are going to be biologically and anatomically correct. Um, so some of the words um, we're going to use, they're going to be professional, but they're also scientific it's, so just kind of an science. fyi it's, it's a it's the nerd night so yes but just nerd wanted nerd. to make people aware um and then we have a whole lineup for you like amber said this is our first one of 2022 uh so we are going to start off with animal love we got some fungi we're going to be talking about some fish in nebraska turtles carnivores diseases um so lots of new topics and um we're really excited for all of you to join us this year lots of great speakers too all right Speaking of which, I'm going to introduce our, our speakers for the night. So we are lucky enough to have three guest speakers with us tonight to help us with this exciting topic. Um, Jason Saint Savar, or Jason the Bird Nerd, um, is from Spring Creek Prairie Audubon Center, and he's going to be representing birds tonight and speaking um, maybe from their perspective. I don't know. We'll see. Um, and then Sarah Nevison is joining us tonight. She is a natural legacy wildlife biologist with Game and Parks. And so she's going to be bringing her expertise on mammals to the conversation, which I'm really excited about. And then, of course, Dennis Ferraro, he's a professor of conservation and biology and herpetology at the University of Nebraska. And um, big surprise, he's going to be talking about her. He's going to be talking about reptiles and amphibians and all the exciting ways that they engage in animal love in the animal world. So um, to get us started, again, thank you, everyone, for joining us. And thanks for our guest speakers. I, we want to just start. I don't think they're done hearing from us. So let's ask our guest speakers. Um, I, we just want to know, since you're on our Nature Nerd Night program, tell us about what made you a nature nerd in your respective fields. So just a little bit about you and, and like really what brought you here tonight. Sarah, would you like to start us off? Sure, I will start off. So um, like they already said, I'm Sarah Nevison. I'm a wildlife biologist with Gaiman Parks, and I specifically focus with our at-risk species. So that does include endangered species, threatened species, and hundreds of other species that we do deem at risk in the state of Nebraska. Um, that's just always been my passion. I've always liked animals, um, went to college, also went to grad school where I studied swift foxes, and I did um, learn about swift foxes and how they made it, and I got to see their pups. 
Um, I will say I am not a mammal reproduction expert, but I do care a lot about it. I know a lot about the topic, but I might not be able to answer every question, but I'm here and I'm just really excited to be a part of the animal love talk. I guess I can go next. Oh, sweet, you got it, okay. Good, yeah, for a while there, it said you had to unmute me, but you did. So can't, thank you for unmuting me, so now I can talk. So I've wanted to be a herpetologist since I was about nine years old. Um, and so I always wanted to be working with conservation of herpetofauna. And I've loved all types of herpetofauna from amphibians to turtles to reptiles. And I have made it my life goal and my career to engage in conservation biology, teach students and make the conservation core of the future and hopefully make the herpetologists of the future. And in my 30 years here at UNL, I've seen a lot of that come to fruition and I will keep going to the day I drop. <laughs> That's great, Dennis, thank you so much. I know that your herpetology class is one of my favorite in college and I'm really sorry to disappoint you that I didn't end up being a herpetologist, but I promise you I've carried a lot of that message forward in science education, so. But both you and Monica have just taken the conservation part. You right, know, we're rolling took, with it. You both took my conservation biology class and you, yep. just, you just went and tripled it and quadrupled it and I'm so proud of you guys. Oh, well, thank I wasn't expecting that. No, we were. Thank you. Let's, okay, just let's save it. Let's, let's <laughs> okay. carry on. <laughs> All right, Jason, go Feel the it. love. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Jason, we're trying. Okay, okay. there we go. Sorry. We got it. Sorry. <laughs> The glitch uh, tonight. Well, I can't follow that. I didn't have you guys in class and say how wonderful you are. So you're awesome, and I love working with you guys. Um, mine's a little different. I think I've always been a nerd. Um, I'm going to focus on that part and less the birds. Um, I am a lister. I have always been a kid who, uh, since I can remember, would make lists of anything he explored or played with. So I had five or 600 matchbox cars and I listed all of their races that they had and who won. I then listed every bug that I caught in the yard. <laughs> I listed the top 40 radio songs every weekend in notebooks. So <laughs> birds were the perfect way to make that slightly less problematic because you can list all the birds you see and people think that's cool. So that's where my nature nerdy comes from. I started though with birds, especially my grandma. She got me a little field guide. I remember seeing the first Junko was the first bird I didn't know that I figured it out from a book. And ever since then, birds, birds, birds. I love it, sorry. No, that's, that's fantastic. Thank you so much. Okay, so we're gonna get started with our topic tonight of animal love. And um, as we mentioned, you know, we have three different experts tonight that are gonna be answering these questions based off the different groups of animals, birds, mammals, and um, herps and reptiles and amphibians. We, I know that we're missing like invertebrates. I know we're like, I want to know about spiders and all that stuff too. So it's not that there's no love for that. This yes. is just who we have tonight. Maybe yeah. we'll have to do a separate program later on invertebrate animal love, right? Yes. But, but anyway, so how we're going to um, frame our questions tonight, we're thinking, when we think about animal love, we're really thinking about, you know, what, what are, what are animals needing to do to survive every day? So surviving is one thing, but also the ultimate mission of life is to pass on that genetic um, heritable information to help carry their species along. You know, Sarah mentioned talking about at-risk species, um, making sure that they're reproducing and having offspring as part of, you know, carrying on species um, at large. So how animals accomplish this, there's lots of different strategies. And tonight we're going to really be breaking it down into the three different strategies and kind of diving in to it from the different perspectives. The first strategy how do animals find a mate? How do, I mean, I don't think at this point there's a like a porcupine tinder, I could be wrong, but how do they go about actually finding that mate um, to help pass on that genetic information? The second thing we're talking about tonight is doing the actual deed, reproduction. What does it look like across the animal world? 
Is it the same? Is it different? Are there some really interesting strategies? I think disclaimer, there are, and I'm excited to hear about it. <laughs> and then the third strategy we're talking about today or tonight is um, parental care. So it's one thing, you know, to, to have the offspring, to have babies, but there's, lar there's a variety of different strategies that animals have um, evolved to have when it comes to making sure those offspring themselves then survive so they can pass on. Um, so we're going to be talking about those three topics tonight. And yeah, did I miss anything? Are we ready? I'm ready. So the first let's one, swipe. yeah, swipe right swipe. Keep going. yeah, exactly. So first one, finding a mate, you want to ask that question? Yeah. So when we talk about finding a mate, there's lots of challenges for animals uh, when it comes to that. Um, well, humans too. Humans, yeah. Like there's, so, there's, right. a lot of challenges. Mm -hmm. there's a lot of challenges, whether you're an animal or yeah, human, exactly. Or whatever. Um, so talk to us a little bit about how they go about finding that mate. And I'm told that we need to start with birds first. So Jason, talk to us a little bit about how birds find a mate or different strategies yeah. that you know of. Okay, I'm gonna press ask to unmute. Did it work? There we go. Okay. Um, yeah, so birds, probably pretty obvious to most, one of the biggest ways that most or famous ways that a lot of birds um, find a mate is bright feathered colors or big long feathers, right? Only animal on the planet with feathers. Sorry, Jason, I pushed a button. So sorry. I sh you should okay, be able to. Go. So sorry. We're That's all right. Go ahead, Jason. Sorry. So feathers, right? And it's usually, it's a probably one of the predominant ways that males or females find a male, either one um, looking for each other, is some sort of amazing bright feather pattern um, it, it kind of links to their health, right? The healthier a bird is, they can grow beautiful, longer, uh, more patterned like feathers. Um, so that's probably one of the most. There are some other very unique ways, right? Sound is a huge part of it. Um, there are amazing types of calls from the, you know, really low booming of greater prairie chickens or American bitterns from across the miles to screeching in your ear, you know, bowerbirds and uh, bellbirds, where they literally sit next to the female and scream in their ear as loud as they can, you know. Just trying like, to wear them down at that point or? Yeah, I mean, okay. if you've ever seen hooded mergansers uh, show off to and try to find mate, the males will work for hours, put up their crest and make this little <laughs> you, the, the females are usually sleeping, right? <laughs> but like, I would totally say like feathers, and like sound are in the bird world, probably the best way that they're finding a mate. Um, there's a few other like crazy techniques and each of those gets taken to the extreme, right? So you think okay. of um, peacocks and all of those feathers and how long they are, or the magnificent lyre bird who knows and can copy like thousands of other sounds and songs. It's like crazy how that gets to a shy diminutive you know, kiwi that you hardly ever see and lives in a burrow and who unfortunately has to lay the largest egg per body size of any, like, and that's ridiculous. Oh, yes. But I'm, I'm just imagining, that. like, you know, the holding a boom box with speakers and, and like, like, but like a merganser, like with the feathers and like, ah. the, <laughs> like in the middle, I don't know. That's what I'm imagining outside of the window. It's crazy. Well, apparently it works, yeah. you know, for some. Okay, that's good, Jason. What about um, Dennis or Sarah, whoever wants to go next? Um, a I can go next. Them. We'll start with okay. the, lo well, what, the phylogenically lower animals, the ver oh uh, of vertebrates. <laughs> Not that they're any lower in any other way, just phylogenically. So I have, instead of one class, as the other two guests, I have four classes to, to look at. And so first, amphibians are very different than chelonians or reptiles. And their main thing is audible sound. Mm -hmm. Male frogs, um, for the frogs, not the salamanders, they're the only ones who have vocal cords. And so their whole thing is the male has to sound properly so the right female approaches him so external fertilization can occur. Um, and so most frogs, like the frogs in Nebraska, they have two syllables to their frog calls. The first syllable says, I'm a male, I'm sitting here. If you're a male, 
you're going to sit over there. <laughs> Get a, okay. This is my and, spot. You know, it's kind of like that butt wiser with the <laughs> bullfrogs. And it really is like that. And the second syllable calls the girls in. And so where I do a lot of my work as uh, both uh, Monica and Amber know is in Puerto Rico with the coquí frogs. And mm -hmm. I'll just do the quick example. So their sound is of the common coquí is coquí, coquí. And so the co, the co says, I'm a male, I'm sitting here. If you're a male, you better be sitting over there. Wow. And then when the females start, when it starts getting dark and the females come out, they go coquí. And the key is what's supposed to bring the girls in. Now, it's female choice. So the girl is going to go after the best key that she could find. And you find them going, coquí, key, coquí. Like they get creative it, with it? Like, are they trying yeah, to stand because out? It takes so much energy to call. That's mm -hmm. telling the girls, hey, I got the energy. You come, you know, bring your gam needs to me. <laughs> and and so right. sometimes right. you have one little frog in the sub corner going coquí coquí gets no girlfriends so he's gonna try her try an a frog yeah him. the whole thing is though they can't change it too much or the female won't know it's the same species because mm -hmm. you have eight species calling at the same time and if they go to if the female goes in front of the wrong one it's a dead end for her gametes there's some kind of balance there between like Standing out, being a little flashy, being creative, but also and you not, know what you are. not too odd. Yeah. Like, but there's there's I'm also a third component. I'm if you're I'm sitting there calling, some advice here. you're inviting predators. And I have pictures mm -hmm. of you know um, predators coming and eating the, the loudest one. Because so it's a choice. You know, you have to okay, I can be loud so long, but then I gotta move or you know, if she doesn't get here, oh, I'm going to get eaten. So it's all this trade off. And with snakes, it's all smell. Really? Yeah, it's all odor. I mean, because they, they smell with their eyes, their nostrils, and their tongue. So they have three molecules, three different size molecules are brought in olfactionally. Wow. And so it's so acute, there is, is completely by odor. So the mm -hmm. female leaves an odor. And that oh, attracts, okay. just like garter snakes, it attracts all the garter snakes in 30 yards it to the area. All the snakes Boys. to the yard. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Right? I like it. Sorry, I couldn't. And then they go from there. Really and then, yeah. yeah. And then with lizards, it's more like birds and the color. Because a lot of lizards have a dewlap or they have color on their sides and they do push-ups. And it's, you know, even some frogs do push-ups. So not only are they making a sound, some of them are, are doing push-ups to go, hey, girls, you know, it, it's like, you know, if you it's go It's like to, girls for the girls. Like, it's like right. there's so many similarities. Right. <laughs> and so every one of these males is trying to impress the females. Okay, this is good. This is a wide variety I so like far. This, yeah. um, Sarah, I want to hear from you. And then I have like more follow-up questions about, oh, lots especially of like the awesome. female choice thing, like it seems, is that like that for humans too? It seems like, but it seems like in the animal world. I mean, we're all equal now. Men and women can do anything. That, you know, That's true, so but absolutely, maybe, we still need to be impressed. I don't know. Okay, That's Sarah, true. let's hear from you. All right. Um, so I love that Dennis brought up smell because a lot of when it comes down to mammals mating is smell and it's hormones. Um, so we have a lot of hormones going on all the time. Unfortunately, us humans do not notice the smell of those hormones. We don't smell that someone is in heat or something like that, but other animals do. And I have a picture so I can show what this looks like. This should share and I should be able to present it. Oh, okay, so everyone can see that. So this is called the flame and response. And you have probably seen it, even if you don't quite know what you were looking at. So a handful of animals do it. Um, you can see it in deer, bighorn sheep, which is what I have up there, um, horses, different types of ungulates. We also see it in dogs and cats. Um, and what they're doing is they are smelling those hormones. They're lifting up their lips or they're opening up their mouth and they're inhaling those pheromones, which are then into different senses inside of their mouth, whether it's near their teeth or the roof of their mouth. Um, sometimes if you have a pet cat, you've seen them do that. They go up to something curious, they sniff, and they look up at you with this big, 
open gaping mouth, they're actually smelling the pheromones. Um, and then the same thing with the bighorn sheep, you may have, you have seen elk do it where they flip that big top lip up and they're inhaling all the different aromas. And they're basically smelling the urine and the different hormones that are in the urine. So they're like reading the information really. Like they're making absolutely the is that lady in heat? Is that lady in heat? I smell somebody's pee and I want to go after that person is actually what they're thinking. Wow. The other thing I kind of wanted to share when it comes down to mammals, um, it can really vary, but in general, we have two ways they find mates. You're either polygynous which means you have one male and a lot of ladies and you got to go find all those ladies or you're monogamous and you have a one male, one female, and you guys are paired maybe even for life. And you don't have to try very hard to find that person or find a new animal over and over again. So in polygyny where you have one male and multiple females, um, there's usually a lot of competition. There's fighting, um, elk are fighting with other elk. They're bugling, Rams are batting their horns together um, and they're trying to show off who's the strongest. And then the ladies get to pick who they want to go mate with. Um, I think one misconception is that only those biggest, strongest central animals are the ones that are going to mate. And it's not true. Oftentimes there's younger teenagers hanging out on the sides and they'll slip in and mate every once in a while with a female. Um, and also, so with polygyny, you usually have sexual dimorphism, meaning you can really tell who's a male and who's a female. Mm -hmm. Very clear in birds too. You can usually tell a sex, um, not of all birds, but you can kind of think, oh, I know what a male cardinal looks like. They're bright red. Female cardinals look a little different. Um, oftentimes that shows up in polygyny, but not always, but we have those, you know, huge antlers on elk and huge ram, you know, horns. Um, usually in monogamy, they all look the same. Um, and in monogamy, you know, there's usually one male, one female, they're affectionate, they groom each other, they dance with each other, all those things, but it's actually very rare. In the mm -hmm. mammal world, um, and focused mainly on Nebraska, it's more rare to be monogamous and much more common to be polygynous. Huh. Interesting. That's really cool. That is, yeah, that's really cool. And Sarah, Jason asked a question. Well, Jason, feel free to unmute and, and ask also. Um, but you, you asked about polyandrous. Yeah, just because research in the past, uh, let's say decade or a little longer has really shown birds, especially. Um, it's again, pretty rare for them to be monogamous, except for large, um, like many of the raptors, eagles, mm -hmm. owls, where it takes a lot for both parents to feed young that are going to need to take a long time to grow, right? Um, many more birds are polyandrous, where it's one female, um, and we didn't know this very long ago. We thought they were just monogamous, but they were actually, they're actually mating with several males to, mm. to kind of hedge the bets to get the best genetic material. That's really cool. That's really interesting. Yeah. So there's so many different styles, right? You can have one male, one female, one male, multiple females, um, multiple males to one female, multiple all around. Um, one example I can think of is mountain lions. So a mountain lion female might actually mate with multiple males and her litter that she has could actually be fathered by different males. So, yes, so the siblings like in the same yeah, litter could have, have different dads. That's incredible. And I feel like that in, in that case can be really advantageous to yeah. that genetic yeah. diversity there. That's and really cool. um, garter snakes, that's why they have mating balls. Because you got to describe this in case no one is. I, I okay. know Monica and I so, are really oh, uh, There's a number of snakes, including the plains garter snake and the common garter snake that are in Nebraska. That soon as the female comes out of hibernation, she st starts to let out an odor, a pheromone. And every male within 30 yards will come flying into that area to mate with her. And studies done show that usually it's between two and three males that are successful. So they only have one litter a year, but mm -hmm. her litter is fathered by two to three and sometimes four males. So she's mixing her genes in one mating, which is biologically very superior. It seems very efficient. Yeah. 
you know. And back to smell, one thing I, I got to talk about, there's this little salamander called a redback salamander, Plutodon cinerian. And it's really small and it's in the Appalachian Mountains in New England. And what it does, the males are just all around and they have different territories. And the females move across different territories when it becomes mating time. And the females will go into a territory and leave if they don't think there's a male there that's fitted, has the fitness to mate with. And the way this little female salamander does that, she'll find the droppings or scat of the male salamander, crush it with her chin, and then sniff it. And if the male's been eating good and has really good rigor, she'll stick around in his territory. If his scat isn't worth anything, she'll just leave and try to find a male scat that's better. <laughs> you have so to you find have a male worth If you're a male scat. salamander, you better have good scat or you don't mate. <laughs> Wow, that's some high stakes right there. I don't know. If, that's <laughs> like like a Tinder for like. I know. I don't like this color. Yeah. Or what if, or what if Tinder? <laughs> Tinder Scott. Tinder Scott. <laughs> or what if Tinder had a smell option? I'm. Oh. I apologize for thinking about that. Okay. I'm so Not sorry. for us. Yeah. Not oh, for us. scratch and sniff Tinder. That's oh my gosh! Talk. But the, well, I always like, want to have a scratch and sniff. You know, because snakes have oh a musk, and I can tell what snake it is by their musk. I love copperhead musk. When I Dennis, catch, as Dennis, there's, there's truly only one of you. <laughs> yeah. Amber, you guys know when I catch copperheads, I just rub, rub that musk behind my yes. ears. I love it so much. But <laughs> if we can make a scratch and sniff guide for snakes, you know, I, I'm for it. <laughs> oh, this is so great. Okay. So this is good stuff. Um, let's get into the next strategy because okay. we, this is going to be even better. I know. So they've been on Tinder. They've been smelling the scat. They've been the Flemings response, which by the way, Sarah, I appreciate you have a picture. So you didn't, we, you knew we were going to ask you to demonstrate it. Yes. And she did it. I love it. Okay. <laughs> Anyways, go ahead. Um, so they have what they think is found love. So right. they are ready Animate. to then carry on their species together. Um, what that entails. Um, which is very important. It is really important. important. Yeah. And it can be dangerous and it can be risky, but like they've got to do it. And know? they need to do it. Mm -hmm. That's the whole thing. That's so, how species carry on. So the actual deed of doing it. We can say reproduction. <laughs> reproduction. Fair, right? Okay. Reproduction. reproduction. <laughs> so what species are we talking about tonight and how do they reproduce? Yeah. Um, the behavior, like anatomical differences, different strategies. How do they do it? How do they, do they the reproduce? Mm -hmm. Yes. Who wants to go first? I know you're all jumping. This is the fun stuff. I guess I could. That's so <laughs> you knew the old guy was going to do it. No. <laughs> um, so it's much different with amphibians versus others. So it, the majority, not all amphibians is external fertilization. So they don't have what's called an intermittent organ. Okay. Are you That's, speaking about or, penis. penis? They Thank don't you. have okay. anything. We right well, right. there's one frog that does, but most most of these, yeah, most amphibians don't, and it's external fertilization. And so what happens is the female is, gets close to the male that's been calling, and he will grab onto her in the frogs, and that's called amplexus. Now, most of the time, this amplexus goes on for hours. There is the clown frog of Costa Rica in which he'll grab onto that female and he will hold on to her until she's ready to lay those eggs. And it's been up sometimes six months. And there has been times that, that he way. has <laughs> wasted away from not eating and dies okay. before he can mate. Wow. He's committed. He's committed. Mm -hmm. But That's most committed. of the time, like in bullfrogs, within hours, because the female's eggs, ovums are not ripe until amplexus happens. Oh, it kind of stimulates. It's not like us. There's no heat until right. it, amplexus happens. Mm -hmm. And so he'll just stay stuck to her. And he's usually smaller. She'll drop the eggs. He'll add the sperm to them outside the body. Mm -hmm. And then she'll drop a coating with gel, which go around the whole thing. And then oh. development will start. Wow. But then you have things like snakes in which there is an intermittent organ which is called a hemipene because there's two of them and they're half size. So we call them the hemipenes. Right. Hmm. Um, so what happens there is a snake 
or the turtle, I mean, snake or lizard, not turtle, will go up next to the, the female after the smell attraction. And he inverts this thing into her coacal opening. Mm -hmm. They don't have what- Which really have. quick, we're probably gonna use the word cloaca tonight. Do you wanna explain? And I know- Jason Sure. Speaking, yeah, what's a cloaca? Let's cloaca is, 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 okay, the Latin is common sewer. So, okay. so it's an opening and it's the same opening to the digestive system, mm -hmm. the urinary system and the reproductive system. So it's one pouch that three ducks Word. go into, okay? Right. It's, so it's very different than mammals. Right. Okay. And that's reptiles and birds. Right. And right. so what the male snake or lizard does, gets on the side and puts in one of these hemipenes into the female. And he has to invert it. And in the inside of it, there's all these little spikes. So when he gets it in there, he blows it up and then she can't go anywhere. Oh my God. I mean, she has to drag him <laughs> until he feels he inseminated her enough. And then he'll deflate his hemipene and pull it out. And along same. the same lines, she can, like with our rattlesnakes, mm -hmm. they mate in the fall and she holds the sperm until the following spring to inseminate mm -hmm. herself. And there's many reptiles that sometimes hold that for years. If for conditions years? aren't right, oh, it's not time for me to be pregnant. I'm going to wait. And they just hold that sperm. For, there's a couple of snakes that hold it for up to three years. You and it's still viable. That? I know that's like, that's like built in like, birth control, really. Three years. Yeah. I'll do it in three years. Like, you know what? I got, I have Let a house now. It's fun. Yeah. Yeah. Now yeah. It's, time. It's, okay. it's interesting. That's a, that's a cool method. Oh, I like okay. it. Okay. That was illuminating. I'm probably going to have more questions about a lot of that stuff, but, yeah. but Sarah or Jason, let's hear from, <laughs> let's hear from your perspective. Okay. Jason, the birds. Let's talk about the bees and the birds. Okay. Let's hear. <laughs> Literally to, to go off of Dennis talking about what the cloaca is, most, like the majority of birds just have cloacal openings and they just have what's either called a cloacal touch or a cloacal kiss. They just touch just long enough and sometimes you swear it couldn't have been long enough, but it passes some sperm in there and that's it. That's all there is to it. Now, sometimes they have to do this many times for it to work because it's mm -hmm. not... You know, there's feathers in the way. There's a whole lot of bending, but practice that's pretty much it, except for ducks and geese and swans. Mm -hmm. And then it gets really the opposite extreme, which is rather like long corkscrewed penises that, and there's some really unfriendly behavior. Like I'd rather even like that make me blush. So <laughs> <laughs> that's fine. That's fine. So you're saying mostly for birds, it's a cloaca kiss and, um, so most birds actually, I'm, I just have to ask, like, don't have a penis. It's just a cloaca. Correct. Yep. Just so that's how they. Huh. Is that, is that, I would think, that still be external fertilization then? Or is that internal? I, I don't know. Uh, it's, it's internal because they actually put the, okay. uh, the sperm still comes out of the male's cloaca and into the females just a little, but nothing puts it in there. I do believe some of the chicken family uh, have a really small thing, but it really isn't used for anything. Um, and then I think yes. ostriches, emus, the big, big land yeah. birds actually have penises, but most predominantly all the other birds. Is that more like of a so primitive much. thing or is that more of a new age thing to have oh, a penis? That's a good question that, that I can't answer. Oh. Well, well, tur right turtles, down. which are, could be said to be precursors to, to avians, mm -hmm. they have a very long penis intrusive organ yeah, so i would guess birds lost it like they yeah. may have had it and it's because huh. if you think of ostriches emus they're very close to several of the big you know almost called dinosaur monster birds right, right. That, yeah that, that were very ancient so but i don't know that for sure so don't quote huh. me it on was it wasn't as useful anymore just yeah, bird. Just, it's fine. Anymore. i'm right. sarah let's yeah. hear it. yeah yeah so we're all mammals on this call, um, I think we all we have checked. We're pretty sure we understand how mammals get pregnant. Um, most all mammals do have a penis. The penis goes in the vagina, and there's internal fertilization. Um, sperm, which are quite expendable, 
meat, one egg, which is not expendable, very expensive. And if they come together and all the conditions are right, the female is pregnant um, for a various amount of time. And then part tuition occurs and she gives birth. Um, so that wasn't mind blowing for anybody. But the one thing that I think is really cool when it comes to mammals and penises is, and I will share my screen again. So this is going to be great. <laughs> I'm so excited. Many mammals have penis bones, bones in their penis, which is called a baculum. So I have a picture here of all different baculums that someone is actually holding on their hand. Um, these make sure that the penis is stiff the whole time. Um, you don't have to really warm up to get a stiff penis. Um, and it also increases the endurance. They are able to stay hard for longer if copulation is gonna last a very long time. Um, one thing that's interesting is that baculums are not really, um, they don't necessarily go along with the size of the animal. For instance, the top picture there is a raccoon baculum. And if you look down in the middle, we have a coyote baculum. Mm -hmm. Coyotes are obviously larger than raccoons, and yet their baculums are actually smaller than mm -hmm. a raccoon baculum. So um, a lot of different animals have baculums, primates, rodents, bats, a lot of carnivores, uh, bears, dogs, mustelids, cats, but a lot of mammals also don't have baculums. So humans, we do not have a bone in our penis. Um, ungulates, so deer, they don't have a penis bone marsupials, rabbits, and whales all do not have penis bones, but a handful of mammals do. That's really interesting. I don't know if I, the, the first time I ever learned that was like, not till I was in mammalogy class in college uh -huh. and it like blew my mind. And so. she like would bring them in. And she show did. Us. That's the first time I ever saw that. Thing. Very, yes. That that's, was, that's fascinating. That's, like, okay, we're not gonna say that. that's okay. fine. <laughs> it was an interesting <laughs> test. Okay, so. <laughs> Okay, so there's a lot of different like variation of even how that happens. And one thing that I was going to ask is like, it's interesting to me, um, Sarah, you mentioned like female eggs are expensive versus male gametes or sperm is not. Do you want to expand on what do you mean when you say expensive? I know most people think like money that we that we spend, but you're talking more about energy. But do you want to chat about that? Really, yeah. quick? I think it's really fascinating and it like helps to drive that female choice in, in all these strategies that we're talking about? Yeah, for sure. So male sperm, at least definitely in mammals, is expendable. They're constantly creating more sperm. And when they ejaculate, there's a lot of sperm in there. And the next day, there's just as much ready to go again. While a female, um, we only have as many eggs as we have. And we, and when I'm just saying females, not necessarily women, but female animals mm -hmm. um, decide, we have to choose, you know, to make sure that this is worth it because we have our one egg, but if we get fertilized, we are then also going to be pregnant. And that takes a long time. It mm -hmm. takes energy. Um, we're then going to give birth, which can be dangerous. And then we're also going to lactate and keep these babies alive for a long time. So it's a really big investment for a right. female mammal um, to decide who and which genes she wants to fertilize her very special precious egg. While in good. most males can go out and they can have, you know, let's say a hundred offspring in a year, but a female might only be able to have one offspring. Mm -hmm. So it's expensive in terms of time and energy investment and also yeah. risky. Yeah. No, that's yeah. really good. And is that pretty much the same um, in the herp in the bird world as well. And that's maybe why that helps drive, like why do females no, get the choice? It's, it's yeah, not especially. in the amphibians. The amphibian females make eggs every year and they make thousands of eggs. Okay, okay. And they do it whether they're going to be mated or not. So okay. it's interesting. It's, it's it's not the same. Um, yeah, and there's a few a little, birds. In reptiles, it's a little bit, but not it's still they're both they're both even. So and, for mammals. Yeah, it's different. Yeah, it's not like it is for mammals and herps. And Jason, what? Go ahead. Yeah, there's. I think it's still that the. It's definitely more expensive still for the female, but I think it's not quite so drastic as it in is in males, um, or in mammals. Sorry, um, there are several birds uh, that are obligate, right? They have to lay four eggs, 
And if they don't find a male or that male dies before they, fer like they will still lay unfertilized eggs. Um, okay. Female cowbirds, especially uh, a brood parasite, uh, parasite bird, right? That lays their eggs in another bird. She needs to be forming that egg to be ready to have it fertile, like soon mm -hmm. enough. So she's going to be laying those. And if that doesn't happen, she'll just egg dump basically and get egg rid dump. of that material. Oh. So I don't think it's quite as drastic as mammals, but it's it's still important, but yeah. Yeah, and reptiles, especially snakes, will egg dump. Um, you know, if we don't mate every year, the snakes that we have in captivity, we'll get what we call slugs, which are just the yolks being thrown out. Mm -hmm. um, and so. Interesting. So you all kind of talked a little bit about the babies and the strategies of doing that a little bit. Um, let's talk a little bit more about um, the babies. So they found love, they've done the deed, and now, like Sarah said, they're pregnant or they have those babies. Um, so is there parental care in your selected group of animals? What strategies do they have as far as parental care? I know like for mammals, sometimes there's like groups of um, females or males that will watch babies and while other animals go out. I know birds do that as well. So for some babies are just like ready to go. Yeah, as soon like, as they... snakes, like see ya, good luck on your own. Mm -hmm. So talk to us a little bit about that with yeah. strategies like K strategy versus R strategies. Talk to us a little bit about that and the parental investment in your selected groups. Okay, um, so when am amphibians, we kind of lots of times think of our strategies, which means there's just thousands of eggs and babies or tadpoles, and there's no parental care. Mm -hmm. But it's that's not across the board. Mm -hmm. There are some that are like the marsupial frog or the pippa pippa, the Suriname frog, they have very small numbers, and there's a lot of parental care through metamorphosis. And the one that comes to mind is this frog in Africa called um, Picocephalus asparagus. And Duh. yeah, yeah. I, I think of it. Um, but what happens, there's a pond and he's made it there and there's tadpoles and he sticks around it. The females, she goes to someplace else, but he sticks there until the tadpoles transform. And we know because we can take DNA from the father and DNA from the babies to know that he does this just with his tadpoles. We don't know how that frog, that father knows that he fathered those externally. But when the pond starts to dry up, he will trench for up to four hours to bring water wow. to his own young or make his own young go down a trench to an area where it's deeper water so they survive in metamorphosis. I wouldn't trench four hours for my kids. Are you sure? And here is this frog. They're not watching tonight. <laughs> for four hours for its offspring. So you wow. can't tell me these things are primitive. They're, they're way more you know, yeah. advanced than us um, by far. So they know that that's their babies, but yeah. like, we can't figure out how they know that they're their well, we, we Right, we know it that we, because we can do DNA, but we don't know yeah, what Yeah, but is. otherwise. Yeah. That's, that's incredible. Wow. That's okay. very cool. But like snakes, they don't really have parental care. A lot of them. Well, there is some that do. Most of the ones in Nebraska do not. And so they don't, they just drop their eggs or drop their babies as they're slithering down the road and they never see them again. So but that strategy Nebraska must work. And in, in like, I think when I when to get at with this question is it's not one is worse than the other, but like that strategy it must work. And help. Yeah it still is advantageous to carry on that genetic information, right? Because they've protected, right. you know, with the eggs or how they lay it or something like that. Right, because they have litters of, you know, 10 to 20 and mm -hmm. they have the females a litter every year. Mm -hmm. And so it's more of an R strategist than a K. K means you're going to have few and protect it. R is you just blank it and hope that something happens. And so there is snakes that have parental care in different areas that actually watch their babies in Nebraska virtually nah. Yeah. Okay. That's good. You bring what up a what great about... point though, Amber. Like yeah. bringing that point up, I think is really important because we as humans tend to do yes. that a lot, which is anthropomorphize, right? We we take our you know thoughts and goals of, of what love is and put that on to what animals mm -hmm. are doing. So we always think of maybe those snakes that don't do that as not being good parents, but it isn't about that, right? It's the strategy right. works and what's working the best. And we do that all the time. And sometimes mm -hmm. I'm like, it drives me nuts. 
I do it all the time, right? I call them birds. Oh, look at this little one and this. And I give them names and I'm like, don't do that. <laughs> it's fine. We have to relate as humans as long as we can relate and then also see it objectively. It helps us connect to those animals. And it does too. help us connect. But it yeah. is interesting because as humans, we have a huge amount of parental investment because our babies are born like really cognitively underdeveloped compared to other even primates. So it requires a lot of parental investment, whereas the snakes maybe don't. And it's totally a okay yeah they're they're still great fathers and yeah. mothers but jason you want to speak more about birds as parental investment and what that might look like across the board i know even within those big groups there's a lot of variety too but you can yeah. speak to that birds pretty much run the gamut um from you know some really tiny warblers that will have you know 16 to 20 eggs or more to really just try to hope that two to four of those will survive compared to then, you know, pelicans, um, our large raptors that I mentioned earlier, eagles, owls, where they have one or if lucky and they know there's a lot of resources too. Um, but it goes as much to, it's like, again, we always think it's horrible, but pelicans as an example, many times they actually have to either push a baby out of the nest if resources are bad, right? In times mm -hmm. of drought or the fish are just, they've moved or they can't get to them it's a choice they make or that they need to do so that one survives and both don't. Um, but yeah, it runs the gamut on care. There are some famous ones and there's some birds that switch it around too, right? We always think of most males leaving, um, which isn't always the case. Um, the uh, hornbills, right, literally encase the female in the tree. Um, and then as the little ones are born, he will bring food back and feed her so that she can feed the little one, which is crazy. Wow. She's like literally encased in the little tree, pisser. just enough room to put food in the hole. Huh. Wow. Um, the phalaropes, right? All the phalaropes, it's the opposite, right? The female lays the eggs and takes off. She's also the brightly colored bird, but mm, the male sits on those eggs, incubates and takes care of them. Um, most of those strange cases are where the bird is precocial, right? Where the little bird, when it's born, can run and feed itself pretty quickly. You see a lot more parental care in birds that are, did I get that right? Altricial, yeah, I think it is, right? Where they have, have to get feathers, right? They still have to grow them. They have, their eyes are closed and all of that. A lot more parental care by at least one, sometimes two. Um, and then the birds that are the most famous for the most care are those that are also noted to be the most intelligent, although we're learning a lot more about bird intelligence. Okay. Um, but like the corvids, right? Uh, crows, jays, magpies, and the parrot families, right? They're all, they work in large groups and colonies, um, and they will feed and take care of young. You know, they have aunt and uncle will help, brother, sister will help. Really? Like, oh, like yeah. a corvid community? Yeah. Love it. <laughs> They will totally work. Now, within that, species-wise, they don't get along, right? Don't, well, don't get me I mean, started on ravens families. and crows. <laughs> like, they don't want to talk. But right. within their own species, they, there's a lot of parental and family care. Um, they cool. work together. They, we've learned that they can, like, use tools together to, like, build and or get, you know, solve puzzles and get food and things. So they're pretty amazing. That is, is that there, is, cool. is there a Corvid culture? Okay, sorry. That's another topic. I just, I got excited about that. That's Let's talk about it later. Presentation. Okay, I, I agree. I'm thinking crows now. Okay, sorry, Sarah, <laughs> you, you go for it. Parental care. What does it look like across mammals? Of course, we're mammals, but I know that it can vary even within the, you know, the greater group. Yeah, so 100% of mammals exhibit some form of parental care. Wow. So all mammals at least do something. Mm -hmm. Um it's just the female, but every once in a while, there are those monogamous species where the male will also help out. Um, in general, when we're thinking about just all species of all different types, mammals tend to be more K-selected instead of R-selected. So Dennis brought up R-selected, which means reproduction, high reproduction rate, just put as many babies out there as you possibly can, don't care for them very much, they grow up really quick and they all die. But yeah, you hope that some survive enough to pass on, right? Like that's Hopefully kind of the 1% or something. Right. Like that. I know right. it's not with everything Dennis had said, but um, when we're thinking big picture, mammals tend to be more case selected. And so that means that we're at carrying capacity. 
We're going to put a lot of time and effort into just a few young. Mm -hmm. We're going to keep them for a very long time. They're very slow growing. Um, and that's in general what mammals do, but there's mm -hmm. a whole range of them. I mean, if we think of mice or rabbits, they have a lot of young. Um, they put out a ton of them. They have, they could even have multiple litters every year. But then we think about like swift foxes, which are my forte, and they just have one litter a year. Um, they do have a few, they'll have about four pups, but it's a lot of investment because they are born blind, they're born, mm -hmm. they're born underground in a den. And so they are more altricial, meaning they need more help. Um, and what's so cute about swift foxes is that the mom will be down in the den, she'll give birth and she won't come out of the den for like weeks. And dad will come and bring her mice and pile them up on top of the den so that she doesn't have to go hunting by herself. She I really like that. The den, like eat that. some of those mice and go back down and take care of those babies. I wish I would have requested that at my baby shower. Like this is my expectation for maternity leave. Bring me food. To just pile the, the food on the oh, front yes, porch. The my, it doesn't matter. That's my focus is on my, yeah. That's yeah. I like yeah. that strategy. I really like it. <laughs> but in general, most mammals, it tends to just be mom. Um, mm -hmm care of them but back to swift foxes one more cool thing is that um older sisters like from last year's generation will stay around and also help raise the pups so you'll have older cool. sister helping mom helping dad everyone together raising those pups okay you just Again, handed like community the, yeah community so the fox community i like just it just to, to go on with sarah said with amphibians like salamanders and everything there's more cases of males guarding the eggs frogs and salamanders, hellbenders, the female, when or, no, she deposits the eggs and they get fertilized. And then even, you know, there's the mouth brooding frog that actually the male holds them in, the Darwin frog, and then they, the tadpoles are in the mouth and that's the male. And hellbenders is the male that watch the eggs and coquies is the male that sits uh -huh. by the bromeliad and, and guards the eggs. I hope we're really like busting through stereotypes tonight and expanding our perspective. Of, yeah. I'm like, what yep. happens in the animal world, right? That's good. Is anybody else though terrified by like, maybe it's just me. Like there's not much in the animal world that like really terrifies me, but mouth <laughs> brooding, I'm sorry. Like, <laughs> like those cichlid fish, like what if you gasp accidentally? <laughs> like it's terrifying. All your kids are gone. Well, I, I do wonder. <laughs> But in the gastrofruiting frogs, what happens, their stomach no longer has acids and it actually becomes a chamber for metamorphosis. So they go down into the stomach and the stomach is a, a metamorphosing pouch that they swallow water in there and food in there. And I feel like you just described a uterus. I'm not going to lie. Like, right. So the stomach becomes a, a male uterus. Oh my God. That is so cool. I, I did not know that. that. Wow. Yeah. Dennis, we didn't, we, we wow. forgot that from your class, I guess. That's cool. That's well, fascinating. We have about five minutes left. It okay, went we, super fast. I know that was, um, I want to, I want to keep talking for another hour, but it's like a good rom-com. It just, it, yeah. it just ended too early. Okay. <laughs> um, so one thing that we want to do is if all of you want to think really quick of a, your favorite love strategy of one animal and our last question. Yes, yeah, so our last question is kind of a wrap up, kind of fun, but also serious. Um, think of your favorite animal love strategy and imagine that you were writing. And like an advice column. Yeah. You've seen the, like the Dear Annie's. Yeah. Is it Dear Abby? Dear Abby. <laughs> okay. Dear Abby, blah, 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 blah. Um, write, imagine writing that love column from the perspective of that animal. What is some advice that you would share with others? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like porcupines. Well, like as they're thinking, can yeah. you share that really quick? Because I know okay. that's my favorite. I, I do. Know you wanted to talk about it. So yes. get it out. Okay. So porcupines, when they, they're uh, in heat, very, very small amount of time, and they will actually urinate on the female to get her attention. And mm -hmm. if she likes that, they mate. She doesn't like it. She's just covered in urine. <laughs> and she has to go find someone else. But our <laughs> strategy. But so the advice for your advice column for a porcupine would be bring an umbrella. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> this is fantastic okay i okay. love that for an umbrella mm -hmm. um so i you yeah, actually sure. yeah you did let me know that this question was coming so i had some time to ruminate on it and i actually wrote 
my little love columns. I really appreciate it. Porcupines, everybody. I it. Yeah, let's hear it. Here is uh, the love column. To all my lady mammals, as you come upon this upcoming breeding season, remember that pregnancy and child rearing are expensive and time consuming. So please heed my advice and choose wisely. Whether you're an independent woman who can handle all the kids by yourself, and you, or if you'd prefer that your mates stay home, choose wisely. If the guys are all in a rut, go for the one with the bigger antlers because he's probably been eating really well and he's probably older and smarter. Choose him. <laughs> if you find yourself preferring the monogamous lifestyle, take your time, get to know him, develop a bond. And if you find that he'll take care of your kids, choose him. <laughs> Remember, your gametes are limited. His are expendable. And so choose wisely. Oh my God. That was so good. That was brilliant. Like, Sarah. Wow. Like, that's great. That's awesome, Sarah. I love it. You understood the assignment and I appreciate it. I want, I want a copy of that later for reasons. Okay. Anyways, who's up next, Jason or Dennis? What's your love advice from the perspective of the animal you're thinking about your favorite animal love strategy? I would say it's, it's a herb. It's the bar, bar tiger salamander, which is out West. And this is different because I didn't talk about these, but the male only leaves about 30 packets of sperm around the pond and he never sees the female. So this female then has to come, come by and pick up these packets and inseminate herself. So <laughs> you guys, <laughs> right? So they never get together. They never see each other and they get offspring. So are you saying that's a good thing, Dennis, that we don't have to deal with the partner and the drama and the well, stuff they just, you just pick it up and go? Yeah. I'm not going to touch that part. Of like it. Us. Okay. Yeah, some of us would love that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, grandparents love it. They get grandkids, and they 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 know their their granddaughter or grandson never saw the opposite sex. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. That's so good. It's, yeah, it's artificial insemination to the purest, I guess. But anyway, <laughs> guys, you tiger salamander guys, leave leave your big packet on a nice big stalk in a clear area so that female can come by and pick it up tomorrow and do it right before a rainy night because that's when she'll be out and she'll pick up that packet inseminate herself and you'll have tad you'll have larvae till tomorrow <laughs> this is so good this is one this of my is favorite i gotta add one more favorite. thing if All you're right. interested in this this is a book by adrian foresight and it's really good. It goes through insects, it goes through mammals, and it goes through all types of animals. I'm very interested. And it's it looks good. It's an excellent book. We'll put that in the uh, resources when we email yeah. you guys all tomorrow. That's awesome. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Janice. That was amazing. Jason, last uh, one up tonight. I have a very simple one. It is okay. from the female oropendula. What's oropendula? I'll put it in the chat in case you want okay. to. Look. Okay. But it's a bird. We'll start there, right? Okay. Yeah. Okay. I like them. This is from the female point of view. Mm -hmm. I like them loud, colorful, and hanging upside down. <laughs> That's fantastic. I have to look it up now. I'm assuming from the name Pendula, is there some swinging pendula. involved? Yes, I'm he just, likes to swing like a pendulum when he sings loud and the farther he can go and still get back up and around, she thinks that's really hot. I mean, how would you not <laughs> find that impressive? I mean, right. yeah. That's really, oh my gosh, this was fantastic. I appreciate everybody's uh, expertise tonight and um, and your input on, on such a fun topic, especially since it's our first one of the night. It was a great way to year. start. I know. This was, this was my great. stomach hurts. Thank you all. <laughs> I'm laughing so much. Absolutely. Um, are there any other questions from our audience? I know we had some go um, here and there. If you think of any more though, I know we probably brought up a lot tonight. Yes. So if you think of any more, we're going to send an evaluation uh, tomorrow along with a recording of this, if you so choose to watch this again. And also um, contact information for our guests, our amazing guest speakers tonight and any resources. I feel like I heard some cool words tonight. Like maybe we should just make sure like a vocab, yeah, vocab list. Because there was some good cool vocab stuff. tonight. Yeah. Maybe we can do that. I don't know. Yeah. But we'd love to hear from you when we send out that evaluation. Um, your feedback helps us make this type of program better. It also helps us give us ideas for uh, future programs as well. So 
Really appreciate it. Any other thing, Monica, I'm missing? Um, well, our next nature night, mm. April. No, wait, March. It's March. It's fine. It's March. Yeah. Um, so our light ecology. Yes. And in fact, uh, Jamie Bachman, she's here tonight. She's going to be one of our guest speakers next month. So we'll learn all about nocturnal animals and some cool strategies that animals use at night. How do they interact with the night sky? It's going to be super fun. Yeah. Just in time for spring. Exactly. Yes. So, well, one more hand. Thank you, Dennis and Jason and Sarah for joining us um, on your Tuesday night. We appreciate you guys talking love with us and uh, thank you guys so much again for being on. And thanks uh, for nerding out with yeah, us. Yeah, thank you. We feel the love. We felt the love. Absolutely. So. All right. I feel like I learned so much too. I was so excited <laughs> with Dennis and Jason because they are absolute professionals and I was just so eager to hear what they had to say. You know, it's good. Good stuff. All right. Thanks, thanks everybody. everybody. Have a great night. Bye. See you next time. Thanks all. Bye-bye.